Why don't we get started? Still a few people coming in, but uh, why don't we start? So, um, so first of all, um, I just want to first of all start out by saying how thrilled I am that uh, Kate has agreed to take the time to be with us today. It's just uh, such a privilege uh, and I, I know you'll, you'll get a ton out of the 90 minutes ahead. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this fairly simple format, but first I just want to um, uh, thank Bruce, Bruce Shapiro for, um, first of all, conceiving of this idea of having everyone in the class read the same book, which uh, had not been done before y your, your arrival. Uh, you can let us know whether it was uh, too much of a burden or something that you found useful, mm -hmm. but uh, we're really glad that uh, he had this idea and saw it through so successfully with the faculty and then um, communicating with Kate and arranging for her to be here. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Bruce and Lonnie and Sheila who led uh, some of the breakout sessions that many of you um, gave your time to attend and uh, that really was in part to generate questions for today's discussion so a number of the, a lot of the questions I have really came from you and from those, those discussions. And uh, I thought what we'd do is uh, we've got 90 minutes scheduled and um, I want to make sure there's lots of time for your questions. So we'll talk for 30 or 45 minutes um, and I'll channel some of your questions this way and then we'll stick a microphone in the aisle and, you, and those of you who want to ask questions can line up. Um, so again, thank you so much, uh, Kate, for, for coming. As I told her, uh, I sort of divided my questions, whether I will get to them all or not, into four groups. First, we, we'll talk a little bit about narrative and voice, mm -hmm. which is such a powerful aspect of this uh, book. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, reporting across difference, which is a subject that we spend a lot of time on here, and uh, which is sort of at the center of um, aspects of this project. Then we'll talk about a sec uh, subject that a lot of your questions understandably focused on, which was methodology, reporting methodology, how she did this work, and then maybe at the end we'll talk a little bit about some of the themes uh, and questions that she explored. So to start, I guess uh, in reading nonfiction here at the school, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, the inheritance of literary nonfiction and the different eras of uh, of that uh, genre's development. And I wondered, did you, th did you think of your intention as literary in some sense? And, and if so, what, what did that mean to you? Well, I think I don't spend a lot of time finding names for what it is that I'm trying to do. Um, but I was very much motivated. I think you know, John Berger was one of many people who said that you can experiment with form at the same time as addressing things that are urgent and mattering in this world, um, that, you know, that, you, that, that, that it was legitimate to combine those two approaches. And what I was thinking about um, from the beginning when I, when I was first learning to be a reporter was how do you make people engage in subjects that they're not, you know, that, that even my mother doesn't want to. <laughs> get into, you know, how do you make people, you know, awake to the things that, that matter most to you? And um, part of my answer to that was to, to write in a, you know, in a way that might um, engage people almost despite themselves in the subjects that, that I care about. And did you have models in mind for this project, whether in literature or in nonfiction? For this project? Yeah. No, not really. Um, no, I mean, there, there's, of course, there's many, many people I admire. Um, Adrian Nicole LeBlanc, of course. Um, uh, you know, I could, many, many inspiring people doing narrative nonfiction, but I'm, 
I'm also interested in, yeah, one of the things, one of the books that motivated me and was sort of in my ear as I did uh, this book was Roberto Bolliano's uh, 2666. Um, Describe that book. Well, I mean, he has a part, it's called The Part About the Crimes, which is about the, the deaths of women in Mexico on the border and, and this sort of enervating death after death after death. Um, and the difficulty of fully engaging in tragedy that becomes somehow routinized um, at the same time as, you know, as one needs to be engaged, one needs to pay attention. And so that, you know, I think he was exploring that tension and that to me was a comfort. It was almost like my friend when I would come back from long reporting days in Mumbai. So, in the relationship between writing and reporting at book length, mm. um, in the end, there's a quite a finished structure there with a beginning and a turn back. Mm -hmm. and so, but then you also describe how long the reporting lasted and how immersed you were. So how, how did your reporting yield the shape of the book, the narrative? Was there a narrative vision in your mind when you first sat down to write? Was it fully formed? Was it not formed at all? How, I mean, what is the relationship between your reporting and your, and your narrative structure? Well, you know, this problem always, how do you bring the reader in? I wanted to bring the reader in headlong so that, I mean, my editor said to me at some point, you know, like, if people put this book down, they'll never pick it up again. Because it's <laughs> so depressing. You know? So, you know, you're trying to think, how do you, you know, how do you know? And I feel sometimes if you, if you don't, if instead of saying you know, if doing a beginning that says this is how it all began and this is the world, if you just give people a person who they find believable in a situation that they find believable, and then you know, I mean, I was essentially believing that if you knew something about Abdul, this extraordinary kid who was supporting a family as big as a cricket team on recyclable garbage, if you had some sense of him, that he was going to be the one to pull you through this. You know, it wasn't going to be my, the beauty of my writing. It was going to be, you know, it was going to be Abdul and Sunil and Manju and Mina um, who are going to make you finish this book that you might not otherwise want to finish. Did you see them as, the, as that um, answer halfway through the reporting, uh, only after you went through all of your material and started to think about how you would put words to page? Or how I, did that evolve? I think, I think one of the things that was so moving to me after, um, so I can presume most of you read this book. You actually <laughs> did you? So, so um, Abdul has been in prison secretly, and um, you know there's no investigation, and um, the police are accusing him of a crime that, that hundreds and hundreds of people knew that he didn't commit, but they weren't. Um, and when when he described, you know, and his mother wants him to, to doesn't want him to be arrested because he is he's their bread, he's their income, so when he described trying to figure out where to go, where to run away, and the only place that he could think to run away, well, the only, you know, his world was so small that that was all he knew was the shed where he kept his garbage. And that to me was so moving and it was also, it, you know, to me it was counter to all this sort of this, these tropes that you have, these you know, images of what a fugitive looks like. Um, and so when I heard that, I found that, you know, I, there's something in the back of my mind that this is, this, this could be where the book begins, um, but it's only later when you're, you know, you're trying to write it that you, you know. Um, I, I think I worked. Uh, I probably worked on the first two chapters. Um, let's say I wrote the book in a year. It was about that, and the first two chapters were six months of that, just working them and reworking them. You know, can I give you enough of the world and enough of a sense of him and enough of a sense of what the stakes are intellectually to um, in that first chapter? to hold your interest and then allow you, then, then, then you might give me permission to do the next chapter, which is going back in time and saying, this is what this world is, this is what this work is, this is what this community is like. There's a, um, another writing sort of uh, approach that's evident in this book and in a lot of your, your work, which is the way you implant context, which is, um, you, you have a, an art of embedding it in the narrative, mm. it seems, 
to me. You don't step back and, and kind of clear your throat this and go to the podium. This is what the caste system is yes, like. Yeah. Yeah. So what is, how would you describe your, your approach to that? What are you, what well, are you I, seeking to do? I've always loved the line of Lou Reed's. He said, you've got to assume that everybody in the audience is as smart at you, as you are, at least. And that's always been my approach, you know, is um, to just assume that, that, that readers are sophisticated that they don't always need to be spoon-fed, that they, if, if they don't get this, if they don't get the caste system, they've got other ways than my book to, you know, to find out what that is. And um, that way that I, it gives me more space to tell the story that I feel is not being told. I don't want to tell, I don't want to tell you that, you know, seven islands made up Bombay. I don't want to tell you that history um, because there are other places you can get it, but there isn't another place that you can get the stories of the people that I'm telling you. Um, and so I, you know, I feel that really strongly that, you know, about journalism is that, you know, the, that to me, if it's already been done 20 times, it's not worth doing. That's, you know, applaud it, move on, do something else. And so I, I have that in my mind even at the sentence and paragraph level. You know, let me make, let me, you know, I only have a limited amount of space that an audience is gonna grant me for the subjects that I care most about. And so I, you know, how to make, you know, how to give you things that you can't get elsewhere um, and not expend, you know, not waste the sentences that you so, can find So that's very, that's very powerful and clear. You do occasionally and periodically you'll implant a sentence uh, mm -hmm. about markets or globalization right. or shining India. Right. So how, what's your strategy for, for doing that? I mean, you, is it ad hoc, or do you have a kind of philosophy? Of I how don't to have drop a philosophy about it. I mean, it's you know, each the conditions of each bit of information you're trying to convey, you know, determine how you write it. There's you know, I don't have a rule. But for instance, when I, I mean, one of the most striking things to me when I first started reporting hard in the slums was that the, the intimate link between the global markets and the waste picking industry. And now I know that that's true throughout the world, but. You know, but banks fail in Manhattan, and then within two weeks, the bottom falls out of the worlds of, of waste pickers. So, you know, the, the Chinese, the, the Olympics in Beijing had lifted their incomes to record highs. So that's information that isn't familiar. So, you know, you're trying hard to, to provide the reader that information, but as much as possible, try to allow the people, the people in the slums were very much aware of that. So. Um, so if it can come from them, it's better than it's coming from me. I mean, when, after, after, um, <coughs> as the global reception began, Anna, the, um, this, this, uh, this Tamil man who, who, uh, who was a garbage trader, you know, said that, you know, the big people in America went in a, a fall and then the banks went in a fall and now Americans were sleeping in their cars or something. I mean, he had language for it the recession, and um, if it can be his language, I'm happier mm -hmm. than if it's mine. So, like a lot of other nonfiction narrative writers, you, you write in a voice that doesn't have attribution, right. and you didn't include extensive footnotes, so one of the consequences is not always easy to tell what you've witnessed and what you've reconstructed. Right. Why that choice? Because I think at the it's part of what I was saying about Bergeron form. I was trying to find a new form to tell a story. I also believed, like I, and I believe this really strongly, that, that even if I don't attribute there, in this day and age, somebody's gonna go and check and see. If people don't believe it, they're gonna check. And in, in the case of this book, there were people in Anawadi um, checking for months before the book even came out. Um, there were people from Caravan, which is like the New Yorker of India, it's a fine magazine. Times of India, Agence France, France Press, AP, you know, that's gonna be part of the process. And so I thought, well, let me just again use every, let me, let me try to give the reader an experience where, where they're pulling close to the world of, of the residents of Anawati and not be he said, she said, and then, you know, in some other forum, if we wanna talk about how do you know, what do you know, what's your evidence for this? Um, then I could do that. But it's, you know, it's, and, and I knew that when I did it, I knew it was like, okay, if it, you know, like, 
prize committees would be like, oh, bullshit. They wouldn't, you know, that, that it would be questioned. And I thought, well, fair enough. And one aspect of that is the attribution of people's thoughts or interpretations. Right. And you write in the author's note that this is, you know, almost always based on very intensive interviewing with the individual. Right. And, and, and I guess though, and so you've sort of answered one aspect of that, which is the reader's access to your methodology. Mm -hmm. um, but another that came up in some of the breakout sessions was, did you fear at times by asking, say, Abdul or Sunil to reconstruct their thoughts that you were drawing them into memories or, or um, a s sense of self-awareness that they might that they might be creating or that wasn't organic, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's, um, it's, it's difficult to know exactly, but one of the reasons that I, I report in what I think of as present tense, which is, you know, whether I'm witnessing it or, or uh, returning to it you know, two, three, four days later, is, is that there's not that much time to create the narrative to make it neater than it really is. One of the interesting things that I found doing the fact checking of this book three years later is that people would have you know, had completely different stories for things that had happened. And if they hadn't been able to hear their own voices on tape, they would have thought that, that I'd gotten it wrong. It was only after that, you know, so, so I think that the, the, the sooner that you report, I mean, this is, this is why it's problematic that so much of the reporting that we, we have of um, particularly poor communities around the world, it's happening after the crisis. It's, you know, people going in after, um, after the terrorist incident, after the, the, the plague, the, after um, the tsunami, and asking people a month, two months later what happened. Um, you lose a lot of, of um, you, lo you lose a lot. Yes, and because right. people, people are, you know, are, are often trying to um, give themselves, in retrospect, control over events that they didn't actually have at the time. So let's uh, move from there to this related subject of reporting across difference, uh, which we, we wrestle with a lot in our, in our business. And I asked our mutual friend, David Finkel, what I should ask you, and he said, mm -hmm. He sent me an exchange. Uh, I don't know who Guernica is. Someone who was interviewing you. Oh, uh, Guernica. The, yeah. Yes. So he yeah. said, "Okay." He, so he, he wrote back in like ten seconds and said, <laughs> "I've never forgotten this exchange." And so I'll, I'll just read it. So sh the interviewer asks, uh, "At a lecture at, the, at American Academy, you recounted that during your reporting on that evacuation shelter for the New Yorker, which I assume was Katrina. Katrina. Yeah. yeah. A woman told you." Wait, so you take our stories and then and you put them in a magazine that rich people read and you get paid and we don't. That, that's <laughs> some, some backward, backward ass, ass bluffiness, bluffiness, if you ask me. <laughs> Ocean May so, Riley, yeah. yeah. So then, she, then the questioner asks, can you speak to some of those questions? And, and you say, she, bit it, she said it better than I did. We take stories and purvey them to people with money. And in the conventions of my profession, which I try to adhere to, we can't pay people for mm. stories. Anyone with a conscience who does this work grapples with that reality, and if they don't, I'd worry. I lie awake at night and I think, am I exploiting them? Am I a vulture? All of the terrible names anyone could call me, I've called myself worse. But if writing about people who are not yourself is illegitimate, then the only le legitimate work is autobiography, and as a reader as a, and a citizen, I don't want to live in that world. I mean, first of all, as extemporaneous speech, that is like the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but so how, how does that play out with your subjects in Anawati? I mean, in terms of the way you saw yourself with them and their voices. I think that, that when, I, when I'm working in a community, I, I, we do a lot of talking about what is this for? Why am I, you know, I'm, it's not like I'm just hanging out and they don't have any idea what it's for. And, and one, of the, one of the things that people feel really strongly in communities like that is they're stigmatized. People once, you know, they go to apply for a job and people, once they know that a person lives in the slum, you know, they, they don't get that job. They know that people won't visit them. They know that that other people, that the people outside that world have very strong prejudices against them. And so part of what we talk about is, is 
is my belief that if people knew more about their lives, there would be less of a tendency to judge. Um, you know, in terms of, and, and, and so, that, so, so when I'm in a community, people aren't, I also explain that I'm not there to give them money or to solve their problems, um, and that, that if I do that, I can't write about them because of the ethics of my profession. And people, you know, in, through the course of, of this work, in um, not just in Anna elsewhere, but it's, it's uh, very few people have, um, have failed to understand that. I mean, people do get that. So um, far. Hmm, so far. I mean, one of the interesting things about that, when Ocean May said that about background and wealthiness, that was in Katrina. That was when like the whole, the, the news media of the world was there and everybody was trying to get on Oprah. And, you know, so it was, a, you know, the situations that I'm in are, are rarely like that. I mean, I wasn't bumping into other journalists uh, in the airport slums. <laughs> um, so there wasn't that sense of a market for stories. So another aspect. Oh, but I, w I was just going to say that my own guilt, I feel, you know, and, and I know that when I talk to, to people like Adrian Nicole, but this, she, she doesn't have it as much as I do, but, but one of my own, you know, I really think a lot about what's, you know, what is this for? Is this poverty porn? You know, does this, does this really have a value? I mean, given the, the power asymmetries, it's not necessarily that you write it and then things change, but so what is it for? And for myself, what I've come down to, uh, really starting some a while back is that if I'm not if I'm just telling stories and if I'm not investigating injustice of some kind that it's affecting you know if I'm not doing the documentary investigative work um, to expose something that's affecting many 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 people then to me it is just poverty porn and I don't mean you know for those of you who are doing documentary work I'm, you know that's just for me I don't have a brittle doxa about it but but that's how I live with myself now is um, to make sure that there's a very strong investigative component in the work. Um, I sleep better that way. So an, a natural uh, next question, which is less about the moral and ethical uh, framework and, and more a little bit about the practical one. So in your author's note, you wrote, you know, there's no way, there, there being no way around the not being Indian business, mm -hmm. I tried to compensate for my limitations the same way I do in unfamiliar American territory by time spent, attention paid, documentation secured, accounts cross-checked. And I wondered, at the end of it, how would you assess, in general and in this project, the advantages and, and the disadvantages of, of being across a barrier like that? outsider? Well, I think some of the advantages, I mean, I, I think that one of the advantages um, that I had was that I didn't go into this with very strong priors, either ideologically, you know, I didn't, I didn't already know what it was that I was going to find. Um, what I, what I was very clear to me after I'd, I'd spent um, five years in India with my husband before I started this reporting, what was very clear to me was that most of the discussion was ideological. Things are, things are, oh my God, things are so great in these lower income communities. Things are as bad as they have So I felt that there was this opening. I mean, as some of you work on your own projects, I mean, I think that is territory. That is, um, you know, when you, when, you, when you sense territory like that, it's, it's, you know, gives you room to move. Um, I sense that there was a lot more, there was a lot more um, theory a lot more talk than there was actual reporting. Um, and I don't think I would have had that sense had I, you know, I would have, I would have sort of assumed, for, I mean, everybody had a story about their housemaid that they were extrapolating into this was what was going on in one of the world's biggest cities. It was like, you know, the, the, um, so being an outsider helped me see, see that, that, that it was an important question, not just for India, but for, you know, really a, a question about how the 21st century global economy was working for its, um, for um, people, you know, and remember that the people in Anawati are not poor by visual Indian standards. They're part of, you know, from 1990 till now, we've had you know, this, this tremendous alleviation of global poverty, but we had a very poor sense of what not poor meant. And to me, it was, you know, let's look at what not poor is. In terms of the obstacle, 
the huge obstacle was was finding a translator with the same ear and patience that um, that I typically have in my work in English. And I went through several translators until I found somebody who was remarkable. Um, and it was, you know, it was, uh, but, I, but also because I used videotape and audio tape, I was able to, you know, if, if it, it wasn't just translation in the, the moment, in the community, I was able to listen again and again and get other people to listen again and again. But the stress that it caused me, was I getting it wrong? What was I missing? Um, it was, I mean, that, uh, it, was, it, was, it was tough. I worried constantly. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the project, I was like, never again. Never use translation. <laughs> but you're going to work in translation. Mm -hmm. never yeah, again yeah. And of course, now I'm doing work that's involving translation. So, so well, you've started to answer the, the next question as we kind of move toward methodology. Um, and let's just stay with translation. If we had, how did you, what was your working method? Uh, typically, I'm sure you had many. Right. Uh, well, in the beginning, I couldn't find, well, I, I had a problem because the, uh, I couldn't find a translator who was, who was very high quality who wanted to work in the conditions there. And that was legitimate because, you know, you can get malaria, you can get, you know, dengue. Um, you're, I was doing work in garbage sheds where rats were crawling around and not everybody wants to do this work. And um, I get that. So, but the other problem that I had is that sometimes the translators made the families feel bad. They made them more aware of the conditions in their homes. They didn't want to sit down because they didn't want to get dirty. And so, um, so those early, it, it was, it was uh, two months of really struggling to find a translator. And so what I mainly did was I, I just videotaped and filmed and was on my own and then would find somebody to translate after that. Um, and in a way that was an advantage because I, I ended up developing close relationships with the families that weren't mediated um, so looking back, I see, you know, I consider what seemed at the time to be a real disadvantage um, to actually have been helpful. But you often find that in your reporting, don't you, that the mm. things that... And you watch a lot of that material over and over again. Yes, over and over and over again. And that helps you, you know, so people have said, oh, that, you know, the writing is, you know, so people have said, you know, like it's, oh, it's like reading, you know, it's like a film in parts. Well, it's because it was film. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was taped and I'm watching it over and over again and I'm describing it. Um, and that gives you, and when you have it on tape, you have a different level of confidence towards your material. So if we, just to get down into the, into the uh, kind of files a little bit, if we had visited you in, uh, you know, year two of your field work and mm -hmm. gone to your office or your apartment and mm -hmm. so forth, how did you accumulate your records of, of the days that you spent out, uh, either just sitting still and observing or you might spend an afternoon doing a purposeful interview or three or four. So what, what was your, your way of accumulating your record? Well, I think that I knew, I mean, I think that I had a sense when I was, um, when I'd experienced something that it was, that it might be valuable, you know, might be something that I would use. Um, and so then I would have the, I would have my, my videotapes and my audio tapes and my written notes. And it was very important to me as well to take written notes, because sometimes people think if you're, just use, if you're using your camera and your tape recorder, you don't need your laptop. Well, no, it was incredibly important for, for me to be, you know, taking my notes on, the, um, on things that weren't going to show up on tape, the way people, um, you know, somebody out of the frame was behaving, this sort of thing. And, and the way that I did my laptop notes was, um, was always with the times, so that I could match the times and video to the, you know, audio and, and um, Cam the camera did that automatically, but, um, and then it would be, you know, watching those moments again and again and again. But it takes, you know, the, you're, you're doing a lot of heavy lifting before you get to that. You, you know, it's not possible to, you're not going to watch every single thing that you experienced in, um, or listen to every single thing that you experienced over a course of a long period of time. You have to, you know, have an instinct as you go is what, you know, what is the val potentially valuable moment. Um, and, and again, in this, like this, this I, I was spending a lot of time, I had so much material. And I, I, I was, you know, one of the parts of my process was to be quite ruthless and to see who gets to, you know, characters that, that, that to me, there were characters who were extremely important to me. Mr. Comble, who wanted a heart valve, for instance. 
was an extremely important person to me. And, um, but you know, at a certain point, I realized that he would be a background character, that his search for, you know, you would just meet him intermittently. Um, through his, you know, because you know, he was like so many of the people I met and, and documented in Anawati, he was dying a slow, painful death. And that's a difficult thing to make, you know, I want people to recognize that about how, how you know, death was everywhere in Anawati and, and slow, painful deaths were everywhere. But I didn't want to write a book that was like, here is one slow, painful death after another. Mm -hmm. And you refer in the author's notes to the records that you were able to access and mm -hmm. uh, obviously there are police cases, court cases that right. surface in the narrative. Did, um, how did you proceed? Did you use the Indian FOIA? Did you, yes. um, and how did that go? Well, it's, so, so w when I started this, this um, project, there were two things, that, two significant things historically. First of all, the, the Indian growth had meant that there was more money supposedly going to poorer communities than ever before in history. The, you know, it, was, it, was an, it was an era of tremendous social spending at the same time because of grassroots activists. Um, there was, uh, beginning in 2005, a strong public records act, like the Freedom of Information Act, but it wasn't being used for sort of systemic accountability purposes. So I thought, so, so it was really the first time that you could follow the money from Delhi to communities using the RTI. But as, as Steve well knows, and probably, you know, um, it's, it's an extremely vexed process in India, and it's still 15 years, 10 years later, um, a society of, you know, among the powerful where they think it's, they really feel violated if anybody who's not powerful has access to their information. And that's why there have been dozens of murders of people who have um, used RTI since, since its, its founding, its real stakes. And we had, uh, often in the United States when I've used Freedom of Information Act, you have to fight and fight and fight. I did as well. In India, we had um, police officers coming to the house. You know, we had people intimidating us to get the information, but um, we got it. And you know, even if you read the the the, the prologue of my book, where Abdul's hiding for the police, that you know, embedded all through that is information that I got through the RTI. Um, when I'm writing about Kalu's death and it's covered up by cover up by the police, when I'm reporting on the burn ward at Cooper Hospital. The reason that I'm able to write some of those passages so strongly is because I have documentation not just about that one case, but about all the other, for instance, in the case of Fatima and the burn ward, I have a year's worth of deaths in the burn wards. And you know, what, in, in, in the case of Fatima, she's, she comes in with 35% burns, and then they fix the records to say that she had 95% burns. You see that over and over again. You see cases of dead children being affixed false causes of death. And so even if you're not using those, even if you're not saying in the book, hey, look at all the work that I did, it's having that work that allows me to write the sentences because I know that if I'm challenged, it's gonna be okay. Because I'm, you know, it fires me up to have the, you know, to have that level of, of documentation. And, um, and for me, you know, to, for, you know, if you have an opportunity to use the Public Records Act, um, in the course of the projects that you're doing now, um, it's you know it's not just gonna it's not just gonna make clear what the story is. It's gonna allow you to write it or present or, or in what it, tell that story in a much stronger way because you have it. So you mentioned um, earlier the way you kind of explain yourself and and some of the compact you you try to create around your professionalism. Uh, when you report in communities like this one, not just there, but in the United States, because of the work you do, you must encounter intervention dilemmas uh, all, the time. all the time. So what is your, how do you deal with that? You never, ever, ever get it right. I mean, and if you meet somebody, if you come to the school and tell you this is the way it is, and this is, I've, I've mastered it, I'd love to know. <laughs> um, I would sign up for this program just to know. But I mean, what you hope to do <laughs> is, is get it right most of the time. Um, but you, you know what's what's interesting. There's there's so many. I, I, I have friends who do this work among them, David Finkel, and and you know. We could talk about nothing but this 
for the next 10 years. When do you intervene, when, you, when don't you? But I, I, there are, when... when what are, what's in just a quick example chapter, of... Chapter 16, there's, a, there's, this, um, there's an eviction, um, and a woman is being pulled out of her home by her hair, by a group of drunken men, and her possessions are thrown in the, the sewage lake, and I thought, it, I thought she was going to be raped, and I didn't, you know, I got involved. Um, to try to you know, de-escalate the situation, and, and that was successful. But here's one that's, you know, what I, you know, I don't even think about those things now. Of course you do that, you're, you know. But, but the things that, that freak me out and, and trouble me to this day are, are situations like Fatima at Cooper Hospital with her burns. It was a terrible hospital. I wanted her not to be at that hospital. I wanted her to be at a better hospital, but her husband, felt that at this hospital, a very poor man like himself would be respected. He didn't want to, you know, that, that he wouldn't, he didn't feel comfortable visiting his wife in a better hospital. So he made that decision. He loved his wife. It wasn't that he didn't care about her. And also what was manifestly true is that Cooper Hospital treated way more burn victims because burning is the suicide of choice among um, very poor people because they have access to cooking fuel. Um, so that, that that hospital was more experienced at treating burn cases. So what was the right thing to do? Was my instinct right? You know, or I mean, one of the things I always try to, you know, consider when I'm, it's, it's not that I know what's best often. I mean, people have, you know, people have deep and abiding intelligences and, and you know, know their worlds. Um, and I don't want to be the person to say, you know, no, I actually, I know best. This is, this is you, have, you have to listen to people at some level and trust them. And, in, you know, in, in this case, Fatim was taken out um, by an infection. And they came over very quickly. Um, so should I have pushed him? Should I have respected him? You know, should I have tried to? I, I don't know. And I'll never know. So as we finish up and folks want to start lining up at the microphone, um, uh, just go, go to a couple of the themes, both in your book and in your work. One of the breakout groups uh, noted that you wrote in the, uh, in the introduction or the words in one, one place where you were um, framing the book that one of your purposes was to explore the question, why don't more of our unequal societies implode? Mm. Um, a timely question. What, did you feel that you, uh, that you gained insight? <coughs> Yeah, um, I mean, you, I think that, that what happens is, is that, you know, what I try to argue in the book is that, is that, um, that, that people are competing so frantically against each other for too little work in an in, 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 in economy that's changing like crazy. I mean, I just got back from Manawati a couple of weeks ago, and again, the bottom has fallen out of uh, their world and the world of garbage pickers because of the crisis in China. So, you know, people, are, their daily lives, the, 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 the amount of work that they expend may be the same every day, but the outcome is completely different. The, you know, you can call it the difference between the mill and the knockup. People are not going to the factory every day and they're not, they don't have a solidarity with the worker next to them. Um, they're in the informal economy and when they think, why don't I have a job, they're blaming their neighbor who has a job. They're not. They're not uh, blaming um, the choices of people in power. And, and that's a situation that suits the, the rich very nicely. And does that translate to other unequal societies like ours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I thought that was needless to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think it's so much because I've, you know, the, the, the low income communities that I've worked in, in, you know, in, in the United States, in London, in Berlin, and, you know, there's, there, I think that, that you know, we're at a moment where we really have a class called the trans-global poor. So much of what people are experiencing um, in these far from communities are very much the same. They just don't know themselves yet as, as a class. So this uh, group of students, you know, they're here for diverse reasons from diverse places, mm. but, um, common purpose and, and certainly a lot of respect for uh, the aspiration to report on low-income communities and social justice issues maybe over a lifetime and 
And so can we just ask you to speak extemporaneously without uh, feeling like you're being called upon to provide advice with a capital A about what kinds of approaches to that aspiration have served you the best uh, and, and how you might reflect that in, in uh, notes for them? Well, one of the things that I think about a lot is, um, I think about David Simon. Um, he, you know, he worked his ass off at the Baltimore Sun. He wrote nonfiction, which is very good nonfiction. Um, but he's, the way that he schooled you know, some section of the American public was leaving his traditional forms to create the wire and tell the story of um, the, the, the grave structural problems in American life through televised fiction. And that's what I mean about form. It's, you know, it's, it's, you've got to find a different way to tell it to you know, people, you, this you know, compassion fatigue or whatever that's supposed to be. You, know, you can complain about it, you can say what's wrong with the hearts of, of, I, you know, the, of the, the people that they don't, they don't see the urgency of this problem. You can do the complaining or you can find a different way to cut through that fatigue and make people see anew. Um, something that they, you know, they, they discount as a very old problem. Um, so I, you know, I, I, it's interesting, this virtual reality experiment that the New York Times do, I'm quite ambivalent about it because it essentially turns individuals into actors the way that technology is now. But, um, but I have friends who, you know, who are so, you know, they, they, they feel that they see the death of print in those cardboard goggles. Um, but <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, I think if, you know, if it can, Juno Diaz is the phrase, if it can activate the reader or the viewer's generosity, if it can activate that generosity, um, that's a good thing. Um, but you're, you're so admired and your, your book uh, embodies the way you have um, worked both at the highest levels of journalism and then also as someone who's willing to um, try new forms and, and prove new forms. So obviously with a group of journalists who are just getting started on their mm -hmm. reporting chops and so forth, um, there's a kind of foundational strength that you built up that is now migrating into all of this confident, um, you know, experimentation of sorts, but I guess um, maybe it's a parochial question, but how fundamental is the reporting technique that you developed, you know, at the alt weeklies and then mm. in the newsroom and pounding all of those stories into print to the freedom that you now have to think so um, imaginatively about the purpose of all of this? What, where does reporting figure, I guess, is the short you know, it's, it's, question. It's all about reporting. I mean, you know, when people ask me about my writing, I almost don't know what to say. You know, is it literary, is it not? I mean, it's, it's accumulating so much reporting that you're out, you're like, your writing problem is, oh my God, how do I do justice to what I've seen, as opposed to how do I make it readable? Um, you know, and, you know if, for me, it's, you know, I'm not interested in capital W writing. I'm not interested in it's pretty writing. You know, if, if it's not, you know, what it's trying to do is, you know, is crunch in a maximum amount of information in a different way that, that will allow people to register it. It's, um, and each, you know, each, each story that you do finds its own form. Um, and I think that there is, a, you know, I keep talking about form, there's this, you know, this, this idea that there's only one way to do things. And, you know, I, I think that, that every subject, that every story that we tell um, has a way that it wants to be told in its own way. Um, and, and I urge you not to get, you know, not to be too obsessed with models. Let me do, you know, how would, you know, do it like Adrian, did, did it do it like David Finkel did it, do it the way, you know, called it in Ghost Wars. I mean, read those books, get what you can out of them, but, um, uh, but you're gonna know this subject matter better than anybody and you have to listen to your own ear as you tell these stories.
So I'm waiting for someone to come to the microphone here at the journalism school full of reporters. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be the first one, but well, <laughs> there you are. You're brave. Uh, congratulations on the Pulitzer. And um, I thought the book was interesting. I just wanted to bring your attention to that one instance where I think uh, they had an American journalist who comes in and uh, you had, uh, uh, I believe, one of the characters create a whole facade and uh, it was all sort of scripted for what the, what the journalist wanted to hear and I just wanted to know why you thought you as a journalist were different, you as an American journalist were different. Uh, because that was, uh, that was a six, um, six slum a day show okay. where people were gathered and they were barely allowed to speak mm -hmm. um, and I was spending several years in the community so there is a difference um, okay. you know you're not being told by an official what the people in that community think you're listening to the people in that community but there's still that language barrier which I think despite spending X amount of time or whatever amount of time I think there is that <laughs> difference between hearing or there, there's that disconnect and uh, I just was wondering what you thought about that. Well, I guess that's, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of what part of what um, Steve read is that, you know, if you have, you know, if you are reporting across difference, then it, 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 it means that you invest a, a different amount of time in it. And you, you, you for instance, with what I, one of the, just on a practical level, one of the things I do is I would, I would, videotape and then I would have different people translate it. Um, you would have a piece of evidence that could be interpreted um, by different people including my husband would do it for me sometimes you know where I was trying to understand who was really listening the words um, mm -hmm. and that means that it's slow as hell um, and it means that that you know it's harder for me I wish you know I spent five years before I started this project wishing that somebody would do it somebody who had the languages there you know there are more than a dozen languages by the way at Anawati it's not just one language so um, so there wasn't just one person that could come in and do it but you know I often feel about you know this work like no matter where I'm working where I'm always other um, you know somebody should do it and if nobody's doing it well at least I can do it and then somebody can come along and do it better you know but but for somebody like me to do it, it's still better than nobody doing it. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. Um, hello. Um, I thought what you said about the impact of journalism, like what journalism can achieve, I thought that section was particularly revealing. Like sometimes you write things and you don't know what is going to happen, whether it has any impact mm. or anything of that sort. So um, I was just wondering that on a very practical level, like what impact did this book have? Like where is the family right now? The, uh, the garbage picker, Emma, like mm. what are they all doing right now? Has any change happened as a result of this book? Well, I mean, uh, there's, uh, changes happen in two ways. One, when, when the book was successful and I made money on it, I put it back, the money back in the community. So a lot of changes happened because of that. Um, but I mean, what does that tell you? That's, you know, that's just random. Um, I mean, I think the essential question has, is, has thing, you know, have things happen um, for, you know, people who live in um, elsewhere, places that, that have, you know, where, where um, that haven't been the subject of a book, um, that don't have Australians walking in and asking to meet everybody, as they do in Anawani now. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and, and... Not just Australians, I'm sure. But a lot of Australians, it's really interesting, you know? <laughs> They're like, another Australian, shit. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think what the... There's, there are specific changes that, that happen because of the book. I think that, that the, the police station serving that community had, um, you know, heads rolled and things happened there, perhaps for the good. Um, I believe that there's, um, I, I'm not sure, but I've been told that there was change in, um, in the extremely corrupt education system for the poor and what was happening, you know, the, the, um, the officials who were pocketing all that money meant for schools for, for girls that disabled. Um, uh, the right now, um, but what I think, what I think that you know, when people talk about influence, when you're writing about very poor people, 
just because you write about him doesn't change the asymmetries of power. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult to bring about long-term change in poor communities. But again, you know, it's sort of like the, you know, the, the, the previous questioner, you know, should I have done it? Well, yeah, it's better than nothing. If I do it, it's better than nothing. If you write those stories, it's, there's still some small chance that something might be changed. And if you don't write about, if you don't write about kids getting murdered and having their deaths filed away, if, if nobody writes those stories, then that is you know, gonna go on with impunity. Um, and I think probably if, you know, the, what, what people tell me when I worry about, uh, you know, what difference did it really make? People have told me in Delhi that there have been people who've worked on these issues for many, many years who couldn't get the attention of the political class. And now that people had a book that explained what was happening in one community, it allowed their voices to be heard in a different way. Um, and I console myself that that's true. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, so just one quick follow up to that. Um, so I'm also from Bombay, so I really like reading the book. Um, I had also worked in the media for some time in Bombay, and I mean, like whenever I try writing about issues like these, like, you know, instantly it's just like it's stonewalled. Even if I do it in my off hours or in my spare time and mm -hmm. I, on my holiday, I try going to slums and writing about it. Like nobody wants to run the damn story. Right, right. I mean, yeah. there's this, there is this, you know, there is this, this sense yeah. of like, it's depressing. It's, mm -hmm. um, you know, or we know. I mean, one of the things that I felt that I really got, like, I never talked about, I never met other journalists in India when I was doing the reporting because I didn't want to be told that my work was stupid, that I shouldn't be doing it. Um, but I think that, that one way you get around that sense that people don't want to hear it is by using RTI, is by, you know, because people will always be interested in the corruption. I mean, that's one of the things that I found over and over again in my career, is that some people will not care about terrible things being done to vulnerable people, but they will care about their taxpayer dollars being pocketed <laughs> by somebody corrupt. And so I always you know, think that it's, you know, it's good to have both. <laughs> um, and you know, the thing is that it, there is, it's like there is, like it's just, um, there's so little accountability for, um, and there's, there's such a huge chasm between what is said to happen in poor communities and what's actually happening, and oh my God, philanthropy? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's another place where, you know, where, um, I mean, I could have written a whole separate book about that, about the claims that people make for what they're doing in these communities and what they're actually doing. Um, so again, it's like, you know, when, you, when, when people aren't interested, my, my friend Amy Waldman, also your friend, I think, um, a reporter turned novelist, once gave me um, a piece of advice that's always in my head. Um, I had worked for seven years on a story following people in a poor community, and uh, the New Yorker wanted me to do something. I said, okay, I want to write about these people I followed for seven years, and they said, okay, give me, we'll give you 3,000 words, I think it was, which was like, you know, <laughs> they would give Bjork 12,000 words. <laughs> so I was like, damn, you know, what's, why don't, why do people think that this is not valid? And she said, subsidize their lack of interest with your surplus. And, uh, you know, I, that's, before, okay, you have to translate that. It from means subsidize don't, lack of don't expect, you know, don't be angry, don't blame them if they're not interested. Uh -huh. You are so interested, you can make them interested if you really try. Okay, okay so just the final thing. Um, uh, no, 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 we got a long line, yeah. sir. You've had your two yeah, questions. Has the level of media discourse gone up? What's That's that? all I want to know. What's has that? the level of discourse about these issues in the Indian media has it increased as a result of this, or is it still as bad? I think you, can, you have to be really careful when, you're, you know, when you do a project to say, oh, I did this, and then things changed because of what I did. You know, who knows? Um, but I, I do think that, um, you know, I do think in part because of, um, because Caravan is so good, because Scroll is good, because there's, you know. And, you know Caravan is run by day school grads. Pretty much entirely. Is that not is that not a true fact? Yes. Yeah. Who? It's a true fact. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean it to be an advertisement. Well, no, but, it's, it's but, still a good yeah. magazine, but yeah. maybe there's a correlation. Mm. Yeah. Um, I only have twelve questions, so I'll go. <laughs> okay. Uh, I 
admire the way that you wrote this book with such a, as, a, as such a powerful narrator and the way that you removed yourself from the story. But I also found myself concerned for you um, by like page 16, I thought, oh my God, this writer is, <laughs> is in this and she's living this and you were so involved. And so I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on self-care. How are you in that situation as a woman and a human and a writer? And how did you protect yourself emotionally, physically, mentally? kind of keep it at a safe distance? Um, I, I didn't do a very good job of that. Um, you know, and I, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, there, for me there was no work-life balance. I wasn't going home and doing yoga. I was going home and trying to do the, the, the documentary research, that, you know, so bringing together that tranche of the reporting and what I experienced. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I think I was, for a, a long time, <laughs> I, you know, I went, I, I had to come back to the, the U.S. for the wedding of a close friend, and it was one of those Brooklyn writer weddings, you know? Yes, I'm and the coming straight, you know, straight off of the, you know, three deaths, and, and it was, it was Kalu's death, it was Sanjay's death, and it was Mina's death. Mina's, you know, premeditated suicide, you know, so, and, you know, I was catatonically depressed. I went into the Whole Foods, and I, you know, practically, you know, had to get an ambulance to take me out of the cheese section, you know, because it was like so fucking much. And it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's, and, but I would say, how do I handle these things emotionally? You know, I'm still, I, you know, I've got anger, but one of the things that I've learned to do for my, my self-care is that, is that I don't, my entire life actually isn't prosecuting journalism. I have a life in which I'm engaged in different ways and teaching disadvantaged children and like doing other stuff that, um, that, that, you know, that salves my soul in some way. Um, you know, and, and, and being involved in, um, I mean right now in programs with the money from the book and things that those, are, you know, those are exercises in allowing me to live more easily with some of the things that I've experienced and some of the, you know, um, I, you know and it, it's a problem for me because I can't just turn it off. And go, but I also think that, you know, what keeps you, what keeps you going in projects like these when they get hard, as this project did, I had a lot of conflict with the police um, and it was very scary, but what keeps you going is the emotional attachment that you have to the people that you're reporting on. And so, if it hurts your heart, you know, that's also part of what keeps you in it. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested to know if you have any translator to other languages, because that situation has been described before. Like in Puerto Rico in the 40s and the 50s, mm -hmm. Luis created his whole fame based on the La Perla in Ponce. Right. And, and so did. Elena Padilla to get her PhD in up from Puerto Rico. So there's other areas in the world, in Medellin, Colombia, whatever. Mm -hmm. But what surprised me about Bombay is that Bombay came to be known as a progressive city, financially mm -hmm. progressive, as I mean, everybody can define it. But my interest is knowing how that is gonna impact uh, your work, because your work is full of a personal emotion that means what was the first impact that you receive when you visit Mumbai, especially that place. Is Anawaldi a name that you made up or is the real name of that place? Oh, every name in my book is real. Oh, really? I mean, and that's part of what, you know, this, this documentation business is, is that the place is described, you can get to it, the people's names are real. You know, so it's, it's not, um, you know, and, and that was, you know, I, I feel very strongly about that choice. I know people feel differently, but, um, but these are real stories and we as journalists should be accountable. And people, you know, often, often this, the anonymity that's used in... in Juno Diaz recommended, and Juno Diaz comes from a country in industrial mm. poverty in a similar fashion, uh, illegal and corruption. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what me, for me is that what you're doing is actually brilliant because you're defending your work and a moment in which people need to learn 
that there's always hunger behind our ears mm. lurking. And it could be you too. Great. Thank mm. you. Beautifully put. Hi. Hi, Thank my you. friend from the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'm Australian as well. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming in. Are we allowed to ask about other pieces of writing? Like sure, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, I was as long as they're by her, presumably. Yeah. <laughs> or, or by somebody else, even better. <laughs> yeah. um, I was just wondering how much time you spent with Kim, and is it Corinne or? Corinne, yeah. Corinne, um, when you wrote that piece. And do you maybe just describe what the piece is for everyone else's sake? It's a piece called The Marriage Cure, which was, it was at, at a moment when the Bush administration was suggesting that, that promoting marriage among poor people was a way to get them out of poverty. And, um, and the place that was doing this most seriously was Oklahoma. So I went to Oklahoma City and uh, joined a marriage class that out of a, um, which was serving women and unfortunately no men because the men weren't interested in a housing project called Sooner Haven. And um, I believe I followed them for about 11 or 12 months. Yeah, a long time. And what, un yeah. what unfolded in their, their lives? I'm sure. uh, well, what, it, what the piece ended up doing was trying to talk about that, that, this, that there was, you know, the policy was trying to, to basically make these poor women the beasts of burden and, and achieve something, you know, end poverty by marrying people. But there were no men in their world that they considered to advance their prospects, rather than the men in their world, and in part because we're a carceral state, um, were, were, um, were more likely to harm their chances than to succeed. But um, you know, it, was, it was also about, about their own um, desire for love and partnership and raising families and all the other ways, all the other structural ways um, uh, that isolation is promoted in a society from, you know, whether it's the segregation of housing, discrimination in transportation, you know, so the piece went through, um, through all the other kinds of um, separateness that we impose upon low-income people that didn't at the time have the currency of, um, you know, that, that these, you know, that, that single women, single mothers were sort of the, the source of all the problems of the American inner city. Hi. Hi. Um, I found myself, I mean, you spoke about the corruption on the part of the police, and I kind of found myself asking in the book why they do it. Because there's, I feel like sometimes uh, they can kind of be betrayed as these sort of car caricaturish sort of bad guys. Mm -hmm. why, why, why do you think it is that the police exploit these communities as much as they do? What, what sort of because, because it's, you know, because everybody is trying to get ahead in a society, and this is you know, one of the things that you see in unequal societies, including this one. You have, you know, this, there is no mystery to what the, you know, what the rich have. I mean, that is what, you know, this is not the lump and pearls. Today's low income people are able to see the contours of the wealth all around them. They're able to see what advantages other people have. Um, and they want that for their children. They want that for their families, too. And if you you know, and one of the things that's happened that's I think quite interesting is if you ask people in slum communities about the level of corruption over time, one of the things that was really striking to me is that people felt that there was an, you know, that, that corruption had increased exponentially within the last 10 years. And that's because it's harder and harder and harder to exploit the middle class and the rich. And the poor, because they have no tenure in their homes, they have, you know, provisional work, they're easier, they're easier um, to, you know, they, 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 they're, they're easier to victimize. Um, and so, so many people would, would say, you know, at, at one time people doing illegal work in the slums would say that somebody would come once a week for money. And now it was like people were coming three, four times a week. Um, and that's because, you know, they also want that private school for their families. They also want that two-wheeler or that car. Thank you. So I you said you were ruthless in cutting material because you had so much of it. And I'm just wondering how you grapple with the guilt of having spent so much time with someone whose story you think is very valid, but it's just not part of the narrative you want to tell. And particularly if they come to you saying, you spent so much time with me, why, why am I not a part of this? It's funny, what I feel guilty about is not about 
individuals. I feel guilty about subjects that I had incredible amounts of material on, like public health subjects. Um, that then, you know, and I, I had all this work, and I couldn't find a way to put it in the narrative, so I ended up giving it to other reporters or things like that. You know, that's the stuff I worry about. Um, uh, you know, I think that with, you know, your work evolves. There, there are plenty, if you look at my, my video library, I mean, there's so many stories that I followed, uh, you know, dozens of stories that I followed and people that I got to know quite well who didn't end up in the book. But if you, I mean, and that's going to happen, and I think the main thing is that you be transparent with, with the people that you're writing on as you go. This is what you're doing, this is why you're doing it. If, you're, if a document comes that says, you know, something that contradicts what they said, you show them the document, you talk to them, you know, you keep people informed about the process because at the end, you don't want people to feel done to. You don't want them to pick up the book and be crushed, that they're not in it. By the time the book comes out, it should, that have been, you know, that you didn't write about them is something that could have, you know, that they were worried about for one day, months before. The main thing is, is, is to continue, you know, is, is to treat the people that you're reporting on with, you know, with, you know, give them credit for, for understanding your project, understanding what it's about, and understanding um, when, you know, when you're going to tell somebody else's story instead of theirs. Um, and I haven't had a, I haven't had it. My career, people getting really angry about not being in a story. You know, sometimes being in a story is a mixed blessing. <laughs> sometimes people are relieved. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been really interesting. And I actually read the book when I was in Oklahoma, of all places. Oh, really? <laughs> but I was curious of when you alluded to having some conflict with the police before, in addition to how you dealt with any. Um, run-ins with authority figures, mm -hmm. maybe even in, if there was anything that you initially had to have approved or on a visa front to be able to do this type of work. Any conflict you had with any type of authority figure as you tried to move forward with a project that was almost an obstacle, but then how you were able to continue forward with the work you were doing? I mean, I had, a, I, I did go to the police as you, you know, to do and say, I'm going to do this project and they said why would you do a project and it's all worthless people over here and you know um, so I did that in the beginning and then I um, because I, uh, because we were assaulted by the police we had to go and deal again with the um, but police but I, because I had some videotape of you know enough of it to make clear what had happened um, we were heard we got an audience and, and um, uh, so we had redress in that way, and, and that's the thing, that's the privilege, is that you know, the things that happened to me were nothing compared to the things that the residents that happened to the residents, but I had a way to, to, um, to complain about it, to articulate it, and to, to have attention um, paid. But what, you know, what I wanted, what, um, I think the thing that was most frightening to me um, in my conflict with the authorities is that um, the authorities were targeting the people who were talking to me for a while, and that was, I mean, and that was a point, that was probably the, the point in the course of the book where I was, I was most, I, I thought I'm not gonna do this anymore because, you know, what, this is gonna, a kid like Sunil is gonna be put in jail for years, you know, because he, just made, um, and uh, what, you know, what happened is after a lot of discussion, it became clear to me that the people who I was following wanted me to keep doing this book and that they weren't afraid I mean, they were afraid, but they, you know, they also felt that, that you know, if, if the kinds of things that were happening to them and had happened to friends, their friends, if nobody wrote a book, that it was going to keep happening. And they felt, you know, there's, like, again, there's never some, I never tell people if I write about it, it's going to change, because I really, I tell people the truth. What I believe is that it's, you know, it, it probably won't change. It's just a tiny, tiny chance that it will change. But people wanted to take that tiny chance. Hi, thank you so much. Um, you you really seem to write like you like you really mean it, and, and you, you do, and um, you're able to slip into so many different kinds of perspectives throughout the book, uh, and with a kind of deep and fearless empathy that I, I really admire and respect. Um, and you talk a lot. You write a lot about uh, partitions, sort of uh, very thick, but. Um, permeable membranes, even right down to the title of right. it, behind the beautiful forevers, there's right. this wall that is able, you know, you can even walk along it. 
but it's rather it's crumbling despite it being a very important uh, integral part of the segregation between these two very vastly different worlds um, and I wonder with the kind of way you were able to slip into so many different perspectives uh, whether you were getting that off the transom or just incredible reporting and fact-checking and probably a mix of both, but were there different kinds of empathies required uh, to slip into different, all of these different perspectives? Absolutely. I mean, each, you know, each relationship you have requires a different level of empathy. I think, for instance, with Fatima, the, my first encounter, I met Fatima's children the very first day that I reported, started reporting Ernest and Aunt Wadi, and they were neglected children. They were neglected children whose sister had died in a pail, a two-year-old, imagine a two-year-old drowning in a pail. Um, so that's what I knew about Fatima, is that she didn't take care of her children, and uh, her, she, she had pro it probably killed her daughter, who had a, you know, an intractable disease, and she was afraid that the rest of the family might catch. So you know, I came into that relationship with, with judgment, and it, you know, over time, I began to understand what it was like for somebody who was called the one leg. Who was, who was the found entertainment in Anawati because of her disability. And you, know, you would think you know, um, that somebody who was cut off by world vision because she wasn't grateful enough you know, and was incredibly needy. And, um, and somebody who, who had recently you know, come to the point where she realized that she was beautiful despite her disability and um, you know, deserved to have relationships with men. And, they, you know, and so, so that was a very hard won empathy. When you think about somebody like Abdul Hussein, I mean, the first words that Sunil used to describe Abdul to me was he has his head down night and day. And that was Abdul. He was like, you never saw, you only saw him bent over a pile of garbage. Naturally, you're going to feel, you know, a sense of enormous compassion about this, you know, this kid who's supporting this family whose father was sick. But yes, every, you know, and in a way you find, you know, you, you're working to find, you know, that aspect of somebody's character that, um, you know, that touches you in the deepest possible way. And then you, you know, you try to use that to animate your, your curiosity about that. How person. did you manage to shift gears? On Fatima? On any of the characters. Um, or Asha. Asha's another one. Um, but, you know, I think that, that the more that I knew about, the, the, let's talk about Fatima, her mother parading around this photo of the other daughter, like, oh, this one's bad, but this, I've got one good one. You know, the more you start to understand the family and you understand what it was like for her, that, you know, that really she had had to fight to be treated like a human being, then, uh, you know, I don't know, that moves me. That moves me like hell. Um, but each case is different. And again, it's about reporting. And, and the, the other thing I want to emphasize to those of you who are doing this kind of work is that is that often when you go into community, there are people like raising their hands saying, I've got a story, tell me. I almost never end up writing about those people. Um, because the people, you know, sometimes the people with, you know, like, it's like Abdul, he had so much to lose and nothing to gain. He had no fucking time to think about a reporter, or what that meant to his life. He was under such stress. Um, so you know, you sometimes sometimes you have to you know get past your. I've worked with photographers sometimes, and they're like they'll tell me like that story is easy. Let's do that. Well, the easiest stories to get are not always the best stories to tell. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So maybe if there, I can't see in the dark how many <laughs> folks are in line. Is it a long line? Is it a how many people are there? Five. Okay. All right. So maybe we'll just. Uh, We'll take uh, two groups of questions, if you don't mind. So we'll take uh, three and then, and then two, and that'll give, give everyone a chance to at least uh, voice a question, and we'll get us out on time. Um, this is a pretty simple question, but I can imagine that it was a very difficult decision process. But how did you know when you were ready to basically stop reporting and focus on the writing part? Um, the, I, I, I opened up the paper one day in Mumbai, and there was a story about um, horses that had fallen over the Western Express Highway and been killed, and it was an outrage. Uh, people were like, "Get the slum!" They were, you know, animal activists were, animal rights activists were saying, like, "How could these horses have been in such terrible condition?" And they were these beautifully tended horses of the slumlord Robert, mm -hmm. and I knew that um, 
I knew that those were the horses. And there had just been death after death and more deaths than I wrote about. I mean, I didn't write about all the terrible deaths that happened. I wrote about the ones that I hoped um, you know, the reader would understand and I could investigate sufficiently. And nobody gave it. Nobody noticed. Like, they were never written about. They were never. Um, and, and so to me, that was like the irony of it, that the horses. The um, horses made the newspaper. The horses made the newspapers. The horses, and you know, people protested, and they got, they got the, they forced the police to arrest the slumlord. You know, attention was paid. Um, redress was made for the horses, and you know, right. that right. was, you know, I just thought, I thought, this is where it ends. And you know, and and the, the, the children, the children who had lost their own friends, family members, were watching as the newspaper reporters came in and you know the focus on the tragedy of the horses when their own greater tragedies were going on all around them they they recognized the message that that sent to them which was like your life has absolutely no value in this community they got it you know and that's the thing is people get a lot more than you think they do so so let's do the panel event thing of collecting two questions in a row and then okay. um, Thank you can you. answer them uh, you spoke of video as increasing your level of confidence in mm -hmm. your material. Take it into account, not just video, but all the increasingly sophisticated and powerful tools journalists have at their disposal to tell stories. Um, certainly those are very useful in, as you said, kind of leveraging the, the, uh, the generosity of the audience, getting readers interested. But do you think that that also demands a certain uh, a corresponding ju um, astuteness or caution or a kind of selectivity or or a discretion on the part of journalists as they employ those? Okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's wait for okay. one more question, then yeah. you can take them both. Bethel. Um, thanks for being here. I just wanted to ask about, um, you said in your author's note that you found the children often to be the most dependable sources. And I was just curious um, if you could talk a little bit about how it was different from other reporting to rely so much on children and for them to be kind of just, yeah, if the process was different, um, having children be kind of your main sources. Mm. Sorry, those are two very different questions. Right, and I, I mean, I think, that, I think these, yes, that, 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 that you know, this, well. this, I, I, you know, as I understand it, the essential question is the ethical, um, you know, where are the boundaries? What's, um, it's, you know, it's really difficult. I use, there's, I, there's something called the extended ebook of, of this book that I just did. I forgot its name. Um, it's, and it's got video of people on it. And so for each person involved, I showed that person that video. And I said, are you comfortable with this? Um, and they were. But I think it's, you know, I think it's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really difficult because in the moment of, I mean, say that when, when all of a sudden um, Zaranisa Hussein is, you know, trying to hold her family together as, as her husband, her um, her eldest son and her eldest daughter are accused of setting someone apart. She's not thinking, how will this appear later? You know, she's not thinking, you know, she's not thinking about the video camera. And I do think by the end of the process that, you know, that whether it's you're working in video or, um, you know, in print, I mean, part of what you, what you owe to your subjects is to make sure that they know what you're going to say and they know what is going to be shown and, um, are they still willing to participate in that? And that's a great risk that you take because it's possible that after the end of three years, somebody's going to say, no, I don't want that. But if you've had, I think, a, you know, if you've had a, a relationship that's open and honest over the course of those years, you're less likely to have somebody do it. What I, you know, in, in, among uh, colleagues and friends where I've you know, seen these problems happen at the end, they almost always are rooted in the failure of the reporter to be straightforward with mm -hmm. the subject forward. Um, and Zach's question about the kind of tools, the or you're sort of, you kind of covered that as well. So what, it was it? The first question from Zach. I thought, the, I, was, I, thought I was answering that question. You did, you did. Uh, <laughs> I think you answered them both. You, you no, did no, I didn't answer the, about children. About yes. children, it's, um, you know, one of the things, like when you have this, this incredibly competitive world, where people were in, in a community like Anawati so angry at the wealth that was amassed by the Husseins because Abdul was such a good garbage sorter. There were so many people that were ready to see that family brought low 
um, that I wasn't able to trust, like an adult would say, I saw something happen, and you know, you would find out later he was at work. He wasn't even there. And the children were able to, the next day, say, you know, like, did somebody get set on fire in the maiden? and did somebody get, no, there was a fight, there was words. And, um, you know, and when I say children, I mean, I, by that time I had been in the community for seven months, and you know, you know, we all know children. Some children are more reliable witnesses than others. None of them are perfect, but, um, but they didn't have the prior hatred of the family involved. Hi, I wanted to ask you uh, about how much choice and agency did your characters have to withdraw from your narrative because you were doing so much immersive and you were part of their lives in such a big way that did they have the choice to say that, okay, this part or this thing I do not want you to include because they are also disadvantaged communities who would not have the agency to really come back and scrutinize uh, what you sort of uh, portray uh, or write whatever you write because characters can not want to have things included you know the, the, the one thing you I mean is this is probably the most sensitive piece of information in the book regards um, what Asha did on her 40th birthday um, and so when we talked about that she said you know why would I lie it's like you know this is my life and this is what I have had to do why would I lie but Asha did now here's an interesting um, example there was one thing that Asha didn't like in the book. She wanted me to take out the name of the corrupt Department of Education official. She wanted to protect the official who was stealing the futures of, you know, tens of thousands of poor, disadvantaged, disabled students. And I said no. And she was like, okay. <laughs> but, <you know? laughs> but so there was one, you know, I mean, when it comes to, you know, this is, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a Montessori school. It's not campfire. We're not all sitting around saying, "Let us choose the the, the story that is going to make everybody happy." Um, and ultimately, my responsibility is not just to the reader, but it's to, um, I mean, it, it's again part of what I was talking about earlier about my my lack of ease with the kind of immersion poverty reporting that I do, and you know, my sense that that. It, it needs to have a strong investigative function. I'm not going to take out the name of a public official who's, you know, who's, who's wrongdoing I've documented at the request of anybody. Right, just sure. wanted to make a really quick small point uh, concerning what the gentleman before said about how reporting in India is not often focused on these aspects and there is no market for it. I completely disagree. I've been reporting from India for four years and I think 70% of my work was on these issues and I think it's really a matter of your consumption choices and not that this work doesn't sell or is not being done. Mm. So just to sort of make it clear <laughs> to a lot of people yeah. who may not have access to Indian media. Thanks. Okay, the last question. Thank you so much for the book and for being here. Uh, one of the things I found fantastic about the book is how it sort of takes you into the minds of your characters and you're reporting not only on what they do but what they're thinking while they're doing it. And so I was just wondering if you can sort of describe a little bit what are the sort of questions that lead to the, those kind of, um, you know, that kind of reporting and is that more challenging when you're dealing with 12-year-old uh, children in a sense? I mean, th that's an essential, it's a great question and I would say that the way that I question people in such circumstances is that I don't. I use questions as little as possible. I mean, you think about somebody like Sunil. So his mother died when he was six. His father is a thoroughgoing alcoholic. He doesn't have anybody to talk to all day long. And you can say about somebody like that that their story is unknowable. It can't be told. Or you can invest the time. And what I would do with, with, with the Sunil and for other people um, you mean the book, is I would just spend time with them, go where they were, he was collecting garbage around the airport, go there, do that, follow, and then you're going to see him make choices that are reflective of his values, and then you're going to start asking him about those values, and you're going to start the conversation that way. And one, one classic, you know, example of this is that, is that I mentioned in the book that there are um, parents in a tree by the sewage lake and kids were climbing up to grab the parrots and they were selling them in the market. And every morning, around five o'clock in the morning, Sunil would listen for the parrot's call. 
on his way to work. And I was like, what are you doing? And it was by that way I came to understand that he had a very strong value, that there was so little beauty in Anawari, that he felt that the beauty that there was should be shared by everyone. That's a real conviction. And I never in a million years would have understood that and so many other things about him. If I'd asked questions, I'd have to wait for, I, you know, I'd have to wait for him to tell me. Um, and, you know, and, and one of this, the, you know, Gramsci always said that there's, he said that there were organic philosophers in, in different kinds of labor, but he said that the very poor were incapable of philosophy, you know, that they didn't have it. I mean, and one of the things that I, you know, I hope also that, that you might see in the book is how, you know, what strong philosophies, intellectual philosophies that people have in these kinds of situations, like when Abdul is describing the value of the worst possible life. I mean, it's, you're never going to get those understandings by asking questions. You're going to have to wait for them. And, you know, like I said, I think it's worth the wait. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, please join me in thanking Kate for her work. On Thank you for coming.